Welcome back to our Soy's online lecture series featuring social science research on Ukraine. And today it's my great pleasure to, to welcome and introduce uh, Dr. Tatiana Zhorzhenko. She is a researcher at Soy's and she's also affiliated with the Scripps Excellence Cluster, which is um, hosted by the Free University of Berlin. And Tatiana um, is by background, I think, well, she has a background in political economy and philosophy, um, but I think it is fair to say that currently um, you also use ethnographic uh, research methods. Uh, you are uh, very well versed in a, in a range of methods and approaches. And uh, Tatiana has had long-standing affiliations with the University of Vienna and also with the Vienna-based Institute for Human uh, Sciences. And uh, she um, has a, also a long-standing affiliation with Kharkiv University. I find that is important in, in these days to also um, emphasize that. That is where um, she got her first degrees, but also uh, worked um, subsequently before becoming more and more international in her um, uh, host institutions and, and outlook. And tonight, um, she is going to talk to us about ongoing research within uh, the Scripps project the Liberal Script in Ukraine's Contested Border Regions, and the talk is titled Living at the Gates to Europe, um, the Border with Poland as an Opportunity and Challenge for Local Communities in the Lviv Region. Over to you, Tatiana. Thank you very much, Gwendolyn, for your kind introduction and for the invitation to contribute um, to this um, lecture series, which is, I think, a very important initiative. Uh, it's an honor for me to mm, be one of the speakers at this podium. And uh, today, indeed, I, uh, I'm going to present uh, some uh, intermediate results of our research project, uh, which um, <clears throat> I started to working on uh, uh, when I joined SOIS. Um, last summer let me just share my uh my screen um hasn't worked yet yeah it's just uh, in a different corner now there we are <laughs> yeah um, and and so I'm going to talk um, about my, my research I conducted in September last year with Poland in Lviv Oblast. Um, and um, as Gwendolyn already mentioned, this is um, a part of um, our choice project affiliated with scripts uh, um, uh, cluster of excellence. Uh, the project is focused on Ukraine's uh, border regions, namely um, four borders, Ukraine's borders with Moldova, uh, including also the Transnistrian part of the border, uh, Ukraine's border with Russia, here we are a bit in troubles, um, Ukraine's border with Poland and with Hungary. And the questions our project is, is asking is basically what is the significance uh, of borders um, in the everyday lives of local residents uh, and local communities? Um, do people see um, the border as a challenge or as an opportunity or maybe both? Um, how do they make sense uh, of the border and make use of the border? And how do individual um, perceptions and border practices and also local uh, visions and ideas about um, uh, the proximity to the border interact with national and regional dynamics. Uh, we are in the uh, more or less in the middle of, of our research project and we encountered two uh, significant challenges. One of them uh, has been a COVID pandemic, uh, as you uh, know, um, even um, um, internal borders in the Schengen zone uh, reappeared in, in, as a result of the pandemic restrictions. Um, so it's, it's an unfortunate development if you want to study borders um, 
uh, they are get, uh, getting um, less permeable as a result of this restriction. And the second challenge, you can imagine that the, the uh, current war, Russia's war um, on Ukraine, uh, the full scale, scale invasion, um, which started in February this year, made it difficult uh, on many ways um, <clears throat> uh, to continue with this project, especially in the Ukrainian Russian borderlands. This was our plan to continue this spring at the border with Russia in Kharkiv Oblast. So we had to, to rearrange and to postpone some of our plans and to rethink partly our framework. Um, <clears throat> But today, as I said, I will talk about the, the other border, the Polish border. And before I do this, let me briefly uh, um, address this more general um, uh, question. Why at all to bother? Why study post-Soviet borders? Um, since uh, maybe 20 years since I, I have started actually doing research on borders and going to borders um, to do research. My, my first project was uh, um, in Kharkiv Oblast where I actually discovered that, that I'm living at, at a kind of embryonic international border, which was um, in the 90s still very much like uh, due to the inertia of, of uh, mental maps was not perceived as a real border. So I started to, to, uh, to be fascinated uh, by these places uh, because borders and especially borders in the post-Soviet space are um, power barometers as um, uh, the German political geographer Friedrich Ratzel wrote long time ago, but this is still true for, for the post-Soviet uh, space. Um, borders are sites of nation building. If you are interested in nation building, uh, this is an excited site for research. Borders are secure, securitized spaces where the state is omnipresent, but they are also gray zones where the power of the state is <clears throat> often contested, uh, contested from below. Uh, borders are sites where national identities and loyalties can be very strong, but also can be rather ambivalent or even contested. Um, borders are also interesting because they have often a temporal dimension. And when I started doing my research at the Ukrainian-Russian border, I realized that uh, it's it's a uh, very often post-Soviet borders uh, don't only separate um, states, but they also separate present from the past. So often uh, like problematic present um, from a kind of imagined and idealized Soviet past. Yeah, And so borders are actually often sites of nostalgia in this sense, and we saw recently how some political actors can instrumentalize this kind of nostalgia when eight years ago um, Russia supported um, um, so-called Russian Spring in Donbass. But borders are also uh, Satya machine in, in, in German. So this is the, the from the title of uh, a German um, scholar, Stefan Mao, Grenzen um, Satya Maschinen, so sorting machines in English, um, borders produce um, due to unequal access to, for, to crossing borders. They produce um, different hierarchies and, and um, uh, actually create different groups. Um, with different access um, to borders. So I think these are all fascinating um, topics and actually very good reasons to do research um, on borders and especially borders in the post-Soviet space. And Ukraine offers itself as a kind of unique laboratory for this. 
um, let me just um, make um, one bibliographic remark. Um, um, uh, this is a book um, which addresses the the last century's history of Ukraine's border making, uh, uh, which was um, the book which um, appeared like a couple of weeks ago, uh, edited by um, two historians, Alena Palka and Konstantin Ardeleanu. And uh, so if you're interested in, in this more like historical aspect where uh, actually how the, the, the current borders uh, of Ukraine um, were shaped. <clears throat> um, uh, this is a very useful book. And uh, uh, contrary to what the, the um, Russian propaganda says today, um, um, that, that Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's borders are arbitrary and it's an artificial state and and so on. So uh, it's a long history uh, how, uh, so to say, the current territorial shape of Ukraine took place. It goes back to the collapse of the Russian Empire and the end of the First World War. And actually, the Ukrainian-Russian border was negotiated um, between uh, the Russian Federation and Soviet Ukrainian Republic uh, in the 20s, um, <clears throat> the, the exact delimitation of the border. Uh, the Western, what is today Western border of Ukraine uh, emerged as a result of the uh, um, uh, Second World War and the new architecture of Europe, which resulted from the Second World War. Uh, in 1954, um, as you know, Crimea, there was a transfer of Crimean Peninsula to Ukraine. In 1991, um, Ukraine became independent in its um, Soviet borders. And in 2014, we saw the first, the beginning of the Russian uh, uh, aggression against Ukraine and the open military contestation of Ukraine's borders. So Ukraine's uh, uh, current, current political map in Ukraine looks um, more or less like that. We prepared this map for, for our uh, internal use uh, for our project. In blue, you can see uh, uh, Ukraine's border with, um, with the EU uh, members, with its Western members. In orange, um, marked uh, borders with U Ukraine's borders with uh, post Soviet states, Moldova, Belarus, and Russia. <clears throat> but it's all not so simple. You can also see that. Part of the border with Moldova is actually uh, uh, a border with the uh, quasi Transnistria as a quasi state. Um, and um, uh, a segment, this on this map, it's a situation, of course, before the invasion in February this year. You see that um, since 2014, Ukraine does not control part of its border with Russia. Uh, there is a, a contact line in Donbas, uh, which separated Ukrainian territories, uh, territory controlled by Ukraine from the so-called Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic. The administrative boundary line with Crimea, which also became de facto border between uh, Ukraine and the territory annexed by Russia. <clears throat> um, so, uh, since the last three decades, Ukraine is uh, actually facing very different challenges at its borders with the European Union, <clears throat> with, the, with its Western neighbors, which became members of the EU and NATO, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, and Romania. <clears throat> this border uh, developed from uh, the closed external Soviet border, which was actually some kind of an um, iron curtain for Soviet citizens uh, to, the, to the more open and liberalized border um, in the 90s when people started to travel and cross this borders, border and, and then the um, new restrictions appeared related to the EU and Schengen enlargements um, in 2004, 2007 respectively. 
And uh, uh, another important milestone was the visa-free agreement with the EU, uh, which came into action in 2017. So if from the EU perspective, the border with Ukraine has uh, been usually seen in terms of um, securitization, soft threats coming from, uh, from <clears throat> Ukraine, such as uh, um, uh, illegal migration, for example, or <clears throat> other this kind of environmental as it was seen in the 90s. Uh, from the Ukrainian perspective, uh, there always have been great interest in the liberalization of the border with the EU um, due to Ukraine's aspirations to join the EU and, and NATO. So liberalization of, of the border regime has been a priority for the Ukrainian um, government, but also uh, something which, of course, was very popular in the Ukrainian society. And if we remember the Euromaidan protest, it was very much about this, this idea of getting closer to the European Union, also in terms of cross-border movement and uh, possibility to travel. Um, this border is also <clears throat> um, um, displays some kind of economic asymmetry uh, so the, uh, this creates incentives for uh, labor migration from, from Ukraine. And this is one of the issues I'm going to discuss uh, today. And the other, the other part, um, uh, so to say, of the, the other side, <clears throat> uh, the Ukraine's border with the former Soviet republics, here the, the dynamics have been uh, different, yeah, this, these are new borders which emerged due to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And especially during the last um, years, uh, they have been started to be seen in terms of securitization and especially uh, since the ongoing uh, conflict with Russia since 2014. Uh, also, the border with Belarus in the last years raised security concerns related to the ongoing political crisis in Belarus um, and the instrumentalization of the refugee crisis by Lukashenko. This is now somehow forgotten, but last year, you might remember this was a big issue also for the European Union. And, um, Transnistria is also presents also a kind of potential threat um, for Ukraine, especially in the current situation. And of course, this uh, this um, has uh, become especially pronounced since um, February 24 this year, when Russia started a full scale military invasion. Um, yeah, on, on the other hand, there is some kind of common legacy of the Soviet era on, on, the, on the grassroots level, uh, especially among the older generation. Um, <clears throat> as as I, I talked already about some kind of uh, Soviet nostalgia, which is <clears throat> often instrumentalized in, in this respect. Uh, but Ukraine uh, in the last years, uh, mm, uh, have been mm, uh, building on uh, distancing from, from this uh, common symbolic and cultural heritage. Decommunization politics is one aspect of it. We can talk about also other dimensions. Uh, so the, the um, uh, situation, uh, uh, so to say, the dynamics is different at different um, borders. <clears throat> and now uh, coming to the topic of my today's <clears throat> presentation, <clears throat> the Ukrainian-Polish border. Uh, so what, what probably should be mentioned before I will talk about my case study, uh, Poland is very important, uh, has been very important uh, partner for Ukraine, uh, has been always seen as a counterbalance to Russian influences in Ukraine and has been perceived as the advocate of Ukrainian interests in the EU. 
um, from the from the nineties, um, and <clears throat> there was even a joke that the that Poland is more pro-Ukrainian than the Ukraine itself in this respect, and <clears throat> Poland supported um, uh, Viktor Yushchenko during the Orange Revolution and <clears throat> actually saw the Orange Revolution as a significant move uh, towards uh, Ukraine is, is, is doing towards uh, um, Europe and the West. Um, at the same time, um, approximately from 2005, uh, Ukraine uh, and Poland uh, engaged in, in uh, um, various conflicts around different interpretations of the past. And indeed, there is a troubled past, troubled past uh, and, and difficult past that both nations share. Uh, <clears throat> so this, this uh, memory was became a um, um, stumbling stone in, in the Ukrainian-Russian relations. Um, and in 2007, when uh, Poland joined the, the Schengen zone uh, and introduced Schengen visas, this was a very painful um, experience uh, and Ukraine felt somehow isolated and especially it was felt in the border regions uh, um, at the border with Poland, where people uh, already got used to this kind of cross-border lives and were uh, somehow dependent on, on crossing the border for uh, various uh, purposes. <clears throat> um, yeah, so uh, in all uh, bad and good times, somehow pragmatic cooperation continued between Poland and Ukraine. They hold, uh, hosted um, uh, a Euro football championship uh, together in 2012. Uh, the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement uh, and Visa-Free Agreement, of course, made it easier for Ukrainians from other parts of the country to travel to cross the border with the EU and, and to, to cross the Polish border in particular. So there was an influx of, of um, <clears throat> actually, of Ukrainian citizens traveling, uh, um, going to um, to the EU through Poland and visiting Poland. And since February uh, this year, uh, Poland um, uh, supported, um, uh, univocally uh, supported Ukraine in, in uh, um, facing the Russian aggression. And somehow the, the um, uh, conflicts around memory uh, and the past became um, irrelevant in this context. So the photo on the right, which uh, I don't know if you can see or is it covered by, by the Zoom icons, uh, shows um, Andrzej Duda uh, speaking uh, in the Ukrainian parliament some, I think, weeks ago. So the case study, um, uh, which uh, I am going to present, um, uh, it, it, it focuses on two border towns in the Lviv region, Sambir and Chervonograd. Uh, both are relatively um, small uh, towns. Uh, Sambir is uh, 36,000 uh, people. Uh, Chervonograd is, is uh, um, twice bigger. Um, 50 kilometers from the Polish border, Sambir, 30 kilometers, uh, Chervonograd. And uh, they are similar, but also different in a way that, that Sambir is an old, uh, like, um, Ruthenian Polish uh, town, which then um, was part of the Habsburg Empire, a Polish town in the interwar period. So it still has this aura of the of the old um, old town and its historical center, it did not change much. Yeah, um, uh, so it, it it looks like a, a small town somewhere in Austria, actually. <clears throat> yeah, uh, maybe not so well maintained. Uh, 
there is a big retail market and almost no industry in, in uh, somewhere, but Chervonograd is different because it was actually built in you after the Second World War. There, were, uh, uh, there was a coal mining industry uh, that the Soviet Union started to develop and uh, Chervonograd, uh, this is the Soviet name, um, uh, which means red town, Chervona has red. Um, so it, it became a, a kind of melting pot and um, with, with Ukrainians from various re, uh, regions coming to work there in, in these coal mines. And Chervonograd is known in Ukraine uh, being the first city which uh, toppled the Lenin monument in 1990. So it's a, it's a very interesting story why exactly Chervonograd, we can talk about it <clears throat> later. There were 20 interviews. Um, I made 20 interviews in two focus groups um, end of last year. And the results I um, um, uh, somehow class, uh, organized in, in three focal points. Uh, one uh, has to do with the challenges related to the, to the history and to the difficult past. The second one has to do with the globalization and the, its local impacts. And the third one with the impact of the war in Donbass on this region. Uh, so, um, local implications, um, the, the uh, Ukrainian-Polish tensions about the past, of course, have local implications uh, in, in these both towns. And um, uh, um, one good example is, is the contested, uh, but also reappropriated Polish historical heritage. So you, uh, on, on this, um, images, you can see the old uh, Polish um, coat of arms of Sam Sambor, Sambor is Polish, Sambor Ukrainian, uh, which uh, uh, Ukrainians somehow updated by uh, removing the arrow um, uh, from the deer's uh, neck, you know, this, this arrow goes back and the, the whole uh, uh, coat of arms, this image goes back to the Polish legend about uh, a Polish um, queen who was hunting in the woods uh, around somewhere and uh, um, wounded the uh, wounded the D with this arrow. And in the 90s, the local deputies decided that it's uh, why should we stick to this Polish legend and remove this um, arrow? So kind of. Uh, updated the the coat of arms, but um, um, later, as they kind of realized um, that the actually this uh, historical coat of arms ha has um, a value as a as a historical heritage. It's actually one of the uh, oldest in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, so there was an initiative in um, in somewhere to uh, to return the to, to the old Polish coat of arms and uh, a lot of debates and discussions around it. But still, like the political decision is very difficult to get through. And um, so this is one example. And the second example is the the um, uh, in Chervonograd. Uh, the the place um, where Chervonograd was built, the, there was a small um, Polish town called Kristinopol, uh, and uh, um, again here there were some initiatives already in the 90s to re rename Chervonograd, which is a Soviet name, into Kristinopol, and um, it did not happen until today, and. Again, it's interesting to analyze arguments uh, pro and contra, which reemerge in these debates again and again. And the last time it was when the decommunization in Ukraine started. Again, there was an attempt to rename, <clears throat> but um, for for most people, this Kristinopol uh, has no meaning because uh, this is a new town, and people uh, came to to work to Chervonograd and, and they were born in Chervonograd, so they have no connection to, to this um, old name, Kristinopol. And 
also because it's um, um, uh, yeah, so this, uh, of course, this, um, again, like, uh, to what extent, if we uh, scrap like this Soviet uh, layer, uh, and, and we find out that there is a Polish past behind it, to what extent can and should we reappropriate re this uh, Polish past. But still, Kristinopol functions in, in certain contexts in the city, for example, the biggest uh, trade center, so, uh, <clears throat> supermarket and, and trade center uh, is called Kristinopol. And uh, so this um, name is used as a business logo for some, by some companies. I also want to, uh, I selected a couple of, um, excepts from the interviews I made. And the, this one is actually shows this anxiety about the, the former conflicts, which are somehow still there, but the border is, is seen and the cross border um, contacts and cooperation is seen as an opportunity to mitigate this, this traumas and, and this potential conflict. Uh, so this is uh, this is from the interview with a representative of the House of Culture in Czerwonograd, and she was talking about uh, the exchange projects they have with the Polish sides. So <clears throat> she told me, in August we went to Poland and later the Poles came to us. As we uh, went there, we did not worry much, but uh, when the male chorus visited us, they asked us if we might have problems. <clears throat> because uh, they came uh, for the Ukrainian Independence Day. And it was, you know, they made us worry. Who knows? We have various political organizations, uh, how it will be perceived. Um, so there was a worry that this visit of, of, of this Polish chorus, uh, ma male chorus will be seen as a kind of provocation on Ukrainian Independence Day. But we overcame this fear and they performed in our town. They did this not only on the stage behind the House of Culture where the public there was already heated up, so they would have been happy with everything. But before that, we had an official part, an award ceremony. The city council awarded persons who had contributed to Ukraine's independence. So there were UPA, um, veterans, uh, UPA stays for Ukrainian insurgent army, um, uh, and the various political organizations. And we were worried about possible reactions of those older people. But you know, to our surprise, they, uh, the Poles, came to the fore and their first song was in Ukrainian. They sang a Ukrainian folklore song, the Poles. So everybody stood up and started to applaud. Then they performed two more songs in Polish, popular folklore songs, not political, not military. And everybody, including those UPA veterans, were applauding, were happy. I think in general, all, all that politicized stuff, artificially politicized, is pulling people's legs and people start quarreling. But if you look at everyday habits, we have the same food, dances, music, songs, wedding traditions are the same a lot of common roots. So this example of this kind of discourse is, is um, actually very typical um, there because this is um, um, how, how like on, on the local level, uh, people talk about um, uh, the, the, uh, the role of the cross cross border contacts and cross border communication and cross border cooperation, especially in 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 the cultural uh, area, as a kind of instrument to deal with these traumas uh, of the past, which are still there, especially among the older generation. But at the same time, what is often un underlined is ki kind of cultural proximity. Uh, on, on the level of, of everyday culture and on the level of, of folklore and so on. And so a lot of projects are aimed at, at kind of uh, making this cultural um, closeness, making use of it and making it uh, um, a kind of um, um, 
alternative to politicized memories. Um, so this, I, I will move now to the second um, uh, focal point, which uh, has to do with the, uh, basically with the economic uh, aspects of globalization uh, and, and the role of the border. <clears throat> uh, as I said, uh, uh, there was no almost no industry in Sambir and in Chervanagrad. The coal industry has been in crisis for in the last years, and uh, so the the jobs are rare. And actually, only the the public services and the railway offers jobs. Yeah, so um, labor migration has been a pattern in the region for already uh, three decades. And this pattern is of course changing. So you can see like already like a third generation living this kind of transnational life. And, and people reflect a lot on this, on positive and negative sides uh, of, of, of this labor migration for the region. Uh, the um, destination is very often Poland, but not only so um, people, have been working in various countries from Italy to Spain and Portugal. And it's not um, rare to meet a local taxi driver who would speak Spanish or um, Italian. Uh, but Poland is, is often uh, um, a kind of um, preferred destination because it allows some flexibility. If you live not far from the border, you can be more flexible. You can combine employment in Ukraine uh, or study in Ukraine or other, uh, you know, um, things. You can combine it with short-term employment in, in Poland. And uh, um, so it's a, it's a significant part of, of the local economy is based on this kind of cross-border labor migration. And these are some um, um, photos from both towns which demonstrate the omnipresence of this cross-border job services provided in both towns for those who want to find a job uh, or to go to Poland, uh, uh, helping with documents, helping with insurance, helping with uh, job contracts, uh, auto insurance, and, and so on. <clears throat> I also have a citation here. Uh, it's a, it was an interview with a local journalist uh, in Sambir. And this is, um, uh, yeah, so one interesting aspect is actually people expect, um, uh, there, there is a lot of investments now in, in the infrastructure uh, in, in these areas near the border. So the, the, the roads are built, or it was like that before the war, of course. Uh, the roads are built and the crossing points are renovated and built. And this is partly due to the EU money. So this is a Ukrainian Polish project, which is supported by, by the EU. But also this was a priority of the Zelensky government building roads. And, and um, so there was uh, uh, there is a kind of very promising event uh, a uh, border crossing point, which was supposed to be built in Nizhankovici, which is uh, not far from, from somewhere. And I asked him, uh, this journalist wrote an article about it. And I asked him if it's good news that this focal point is going to be built. And he said, it's good news indeed. I have been talking about it since 20 years, various officials who visited us here were cutting this window to Europe. If you take, for example, Hiriv, and Hiriv is another small town nearby, there is an international crossing point, uh, Smilnica, nearby. Hiriv used to be gray and dirty. After Smilnica was open, this is already 15 years ago, the town has revived. Why? People started to go to Poland to buy cheap sausages to earn money there, to invest here, local business started to flourish. Today, if there is an international crossing point, people are getting richer. If we want it or not, this is a fact. It's too bad that we get richer from the border with Poland and not from Ukrainian profits, but there is nothing we can do about it. 
And then he says, after the, that article you mentioned, there was a comment on Facebook. The man who wrote it claimed that instead of building a border crossing point, Poles should invest this money to build a factory to employ 500 people. I was surprised by this comment from someone who knows our local situation. Why? No investor will go into this 30 kilometer border zone because our people have already learned to live trans-border lives. If you take Lviv and its surroundings, there you can still hope for investments um, because Lviv is big, small towns and villages are nearby. So there are still working hands. Here at our place, there is no working hands left. If today you try to find a good turner or milling machine operator, so qualified working force, you will not find any because all of them are already over there in Poland. So again, it's a very, uh, I think, rich um, um, fragment which uh, shows the ambiguity of, of this development. So people hope that actually investments in the crossing points will bring some economic development. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, the, the only development they can bring that the people start uh, can travel more, yeah? But uh, hopes that, that uh, um, some kind of, of uh, business investments will be made in this territory are often seen with skepticism of, uh, as we can see here, because uh, for these journalists, the, the, these people living at the border, they are already, um, they are living different lifestyle and they are not going to, to agree to work in a, in a I don't know, um, like industry. Um, I think I'm. Um, this is the, the third uh, focal point I wanted to uh, talk about is how the conflict in Donbass actually affects. Uh, so the conflict at one border affects uh, the opposite border, right? And Donbass is is far away, but it's unexpectedly close. Um, uh, feels close in in Sambir and in Chervonograd and the the uh, this conflict with russia and this was half a year ago the war was need, not still not in the side uh, people uh, um, it was still very present yeah and uh so the uh, the echoes of this war could be seen uh, on the streets uh, on the central streets of Sambia, for example the portraits of the military who fell in donbass or the memorial on the local cemetery um, and and uh, one citation here again to this um, topic uh, from a former deputy of the local council in Sambir who was talking about uh, relations with Russians and with the Poles um, in this context Russians are helping us to make friends with Poles especially because of Nord Stream they do not understand what they are doing. They are cementing the Ukrainian-Polish relations because it concerns the Poles as well. They don't want Moscali, uh, this is a pejorative for Russians, at their border. One should be aware of this and see it as a long-term perspective. You are probably often in Lviv and on Rynek you hear a lot of Polish. Poles in Lviv feels like at home feel like at home. You hear Polish in cafes, in bars, on the streets. It is just normal. Uh, a Pole in Lviv, this is absolutely okay. The same about a Ukrainian in Przemysl in, on the Polish side. There is no unfriendly reaction. In Poland, they hear Ukrainian and it's not a problem. This is how it should be. It just happened that we were divided by borders historically. Uh, historically, they moved here and there, the borders. Polish Lviv, Ukrainian Przemysl, well, but now there is not, this is not felt anymore. The Soviet barbed wire has disappeared. Uh, there is free communication and this is normal. This is how it should be. But there in the East, there must be a great wall. Only we should think about where exactly to put it. So to make conclusions, some conclusions to this um, brief presentation, the border with Poland and with the EU uh, uh, is seen in 
often in positive terms because it provides more choices, more opportunities, more flexibility for people living near the border. Uh, the negative uh, aspect of of uh, of, uh, of the border is, of course, that that the, these are the effects of mass labor migration, shrinking population, young people leaving, uh, family problems because of the absence of of one of the parents, for example. But the one on the positive side, people uh, spoke. Uh, a lot about a different culture they have there on various levels. So like the culture which emerges from learning from Europe because people are traveling to Europe and they learn, for example, how to do gathering, how to build houses, but also how to behave and how to... So it's, it's a kind of civilizational impact that they are talking uh, often about, talking about this, this proximity to Europe. Um, yeah, so the opportunity for local communities to cross-border cooperation projects, EU funding, cross-border tourism, uh, but often people complain that the local authorities do not use these opportunities uh, fully. <clears throat> uh, and uh, also the, uh, certain, uh, the, the uncertainty of economic perspectives for such towns as Samber and Cervanagrada often discussed uh, in open terms, like uh, of how they can uh, um, somehow survive in, in the future, should it be like an IT cluster, uh, tourism development, maybe trade. Um, so these are all open questions. Um, dealing with the past, I talked already the border as, a, as, a, as a, a traumatic space, but also as a space where some kind of healing is happening. And the EU as a provider of stability and security, especially in the context of the war in Donbass. And of course, things are changing in, uh, since February 24, and we are planning to continue our research in the new um, uh, under the new conditions. Uh, this photo actually shows a, a memorial to the displaced Ukrainians uh, who were displaced from Poland, ethnic Ukrainians, as a result of forced displacements. And you see buses bringing now refugees to the border. So it's like uh, several layers of displacement. And the photo I took from a local Sambia, um, from a Facebook of a local Sambia journalist who actually referred to the multi layerness of this experience. So I stop here. Thank you very much. And uh, I stop sharing. Thank you so much, Tatiana. Um, there was a lot there. I'm sure we're <laughs> going to have a good um, discussion now. I already see the first question from Tamara in the chat. Please, to, to all of you uh, listening in, please write your questions, comments in the chat, and I'll pick them up um, from there. And Tamara is asking if there are any uh, gender aspects to your research topic, um, especially concerning labor migration, but I suppose it could be also other, other dimensions. Yeah, thank you, Tamara. Uh, um, yeah, so gender aspects, uh, present of course we we did not like focus on this because we only um we uh, basically made interviews with with the representatives of the local elites but in in the focus groups we we invited both um, male and female participants and the uh yeah so this different of course different experience with labor migration was addressed for example in uh, during the focus groups discussions and and uh, uh yeah i uh i'm now thinking what could be an interesting example um to 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 give you Yeah, so it did not, uh, that nothing comes to, to my mind immediately, but I keep your question in, in mind. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I, I don't see currently any more questions. Oh, there's another question coming in. Otherwise, I was going to add my own, but I wait for a moment. Um, Larissa is asking, could you please tell me whether you studied the skill composition of outward migration from Ukraine to Poland? Is it possible to say that mostly low-skilled workers um, try to migrate from Ukraine? In other words, is there a link between the level of education or mm. people and their propensity to migrate from Ukraine to Poland? Um, yeah, we did not. We did not uh, like um, study this uh, in 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 detail. But from from the interviews, I get the impression that it's. Um, of course, mostly like low, um, low scaled uh, work, which is uh, low, um, low skill uh, work, which is um, in demand on demand in Poland and and people going there. They, uh, um, so the most typical jobs are jobs in agriculture, seasonal jobs, uh, jobs in in um, care like uh, uh, taking care of, of uh, elderly or children or uh, sick people um, and, and jobs on construction sites for men. So th these are low, uh, low skill jobs. Uh, on the other hand, uh, something I did not have time to mention uh, in my presentation is the growing tendency to um, like educational tourism. So people would go to, to um, to Poland, young people to uh, to study, and uh, uh, many of them are, of course, intending to to stay in Poland. So this this is um, uh, um, a new development, I think, on this scale. Yeah, like uh, going to study to Poland has become a real option, and uh, for for many families, it's a kind of choice if their children should study in Lviv, for example, or go to Poland and. Uh, this is, of course, can be seen as a kind of potential uh, uh, high skill uh, labor migration. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I want to ask you um, a, a couple of things, and the questions are maybe um, quite far apart. But one is really as you study kind of different locations along the border in, in, in a lot of detail and close up. Um, what are the things that surprised you most? Um, and, and I wonder if it's also to do with variation in places that are not so far um, from one another, perhaps, but um, I'd be curious um, to, to, to hear about that. And um, I, I, I didn't, um, initially when I introduced you, I forgot to mention um, your book, which was widely received and discussed on borderlands into bordered lands, um, geopolitics of identity in post-Soviet Ukraine, which came out in 2010. And I'm wondering um, how you conceptually think about the current project in these terms of, or, or, or are you thinking about it in those terms and what are borderlands, what are bordered lands and or mm. do you maybe use even other other terms to describe what you're, you're currently observing? Um. Thank you, Gwendolyn. Uh, so I start with the second question. Maybe I um, um, yeah. So I I find it um, now a bit the term borderlands <clears throat> in this current uh, current discussion. Uh, uh, yeah. So. Where to start? I think in 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 this current discourse uh, on uh, uh, since the, the uh, Russian invasion on Ukraine started, it's there is a kind of tendency, but even before, so since two thousand fourteen, so this this um, especially in the media or in in a kind of popular um, <clears throat> discourse, you often have this like. Ukraine is means actually in translation means borderlands, yeah. So it's a kind of lands in between, grand land, yeah. And and so this, um, uh, in a way, often is presented as something you know, uh, 
this is borderlands. So no, uh, no surprise that that there are all these kind of you know that that uh, it it becomes a, an object of territorial expansion, aggression. So it was Germany in the Second World War. Now it's Russia. So it's a fate of borderlands. And borderlands, I think, as a concept uh, which is often essentialized as something in between. I think it's it's uh, um, something we should become more reflective about in 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 this co context of of the current of the current war. Um, but I know, of course, that there are different meanings to 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 the to the um, concept of borderlands in in post-colonial studies, for example, where again we can maybe try to to rethink what actually borderlands means and um uh, in in this post-colonial context and in this kind of postmodern context is often like um uh, borderlands is seen as a kind of you know area where identities are hybrid and blurred and and uh, so cultures come into contact so it's a kind of utopia of of um you know uh, coexistence and utopia of avoiding this kind of nationalist uh, delimitation of of uh, of the space and uh, actually again I, I keep thinking about it in the context of the current um, military conflict this is something which can be um, we, we we have to be aware of the of the ambiguity of this, this idea of the borderlands and and the 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 the, the blurred borderland blurred identities or or ambivalent identities or hybrid identities, this kind of fashionable concepts, uh, in in a context of securitization, they are not necessarily something positive, but they can be instrumentalized by by. Um, certain political actors. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first question uh, on surprise, so what surprised me, um, uh, I don't know, I actually, I um, uh, probably many things and I came back with very fresh impressions from, from this field trip and uh, uh, now they are a bit like under the layer of 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 this um, recent tragic events uh, but for example one thing which surprised me was for example this um the city uh, uh, of chervanagrad which i first saw and in my eyes it was like a, a typical industrial soviet ukrainian city you would be uh, uh, you would find somewhere in Donbass, for example, to, as uh, the the architecture, the the city planning, the the um, the whole composition. It looks looked very not not at all like according to our stereotypes how you, Western Ukraine looks, you know. Um, so and and it was then somehow interesting to discover that despite this kind of totally Soviet look, it's a. Um, a very kind of uh, Ukrainian city uh, where people speak Ukrainian, and it's it's a lot of like uh, 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 Ukrainian like patriotic organizations there, and and so despite this kind of Soviet industrial past and this mining uh, uh, industry, it's it's a. Uh, in terms of cultural identity and in terms of, of kind of urban identity, it's it's a very Ukrainian city. And the, the, the fact that, uh, as, as I said, this was the first city where they removed uh, the Lenin monument back in 1990 was because actually I realized it first when I came there, why it was in Chervonograd, because it was a kind of combined um, effect of national mobilization on the one hand narodny ruch you know and like ukrainian intelligentsia uh, being critical about the the crimes of the soviet regime and you had like this mining um uh the the uh, 
the strikes of the miners, uh, which uh, put pressure on the local authorities. And unlike the miners in Donbass, they had this anti-Soviet impetus already. And so they demanded, actually, the miners demanded the Lenin monument to be removed. So it's uh, for me, it was very interesting because this is something you would not uh, find in, for example, in Eastern Ukraine where, um, yeah, I probably should stop. Thank you very much for a very thoughtful answer. Um, there's a couple of questions relating to migration still. Uh, I mm. tie them together here. Joachim is asking if you could elaborate a bit more on the um, workers migrating to Poland. I mean, do they migrate back and forth? How long do they stay? And then Kerstin in, a, in another migration related question asked about um, um, migration over the Russian border in, in sort of recent years. How had that changed? When had that changed? And, and maybe the two you can, you can ans answer together. So the migration yeah. dynamics on both both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So um, I think from from what I from the answers we got from the interviews we collected and also from the focus groups, uh, I think this uh, uh, these are very different uh, patterns of migration, labor migration, and some of them are really like short term migration, seasonal work. Um, sometimes these are like longer contracts. It all depends on on uh, what uh, what are the priorities for for people. And also we we observed or we identified, for example, some some changes. So people often uh, would be saying that. Uh, so in former times, like uh, the work in Poland was more like in gray zone. It was not uh, um, somehow half official and so on. And why the, the real employment was in Ukraine, like official employment. But then uh, uh, I think Poland has uh, um, liberalized and improved its uh, uh, labor migration regulations and it has become easier for Ukrainians to get jobs uh, in in official way so it's it's not anymore like gray zone it's all official it's uh, these are contracts and and uh, people would say you know now we, we work there's a kind of gray contracts we have in Ukraine but in Poland it's official also people like started to travel uh, family wise i think there is a change like the younger generation from what people were saying like we learned that it's very uh, hard for a family if people are separated like um, family members are separated for a long time so the that younger people looking at their parents they actually often decide to go together and to to find um, to if if it's like for for longer time they decide not to separate but they look for a job where they could, could be together and not to somehow to to endanger their their partnership partnership relations yeah so this this kind of things but i i'm really i think one needs like a more detailed research focusing on on this aspect to to learn more, but I think this uh, it's it's a very interesting topic. In general, um, there have been a lot of labor migration to Russia in in former times. Again, uh, this is the second part of the question. I think now, <clears throat> in terms of numbers, uh, uh, it's like the the flow to Russia has been decreasing e even before the conflict. Uh, um, in um, even before, of course, the, the, this year's invasion, but also um, uh, in the last years, due to the conflict with Russia, due to the political situation, but also due to the generational change, because for uh, going to Russia is more kind of, uh, of appropriate for, for the older generation, which still shares this kind of cultural proximity and with Russia and maybe, um, uh, have relatives in Russia, but I think also because of some kind of competition, so it has become the the labor situ market situation in Europe has become more attractive for Ukrainians, and this is 
what is pulling uh, people, uh, so to say, uh, from Russia to go rather to, to, to the countries of Europe. Mm. Thank you. Cassian is also asking about your um, points about the memory and memory wars, as she calls it here, and their impact on, every, on the everyday level. Is there a connection, a direct connection between political events, speeches, and so on, and the developments in the border regions, or do they follow different logics? Um, That's quite a big question. Yeah, it's it's a it's a good question, and and uh, this is of course you know not the first first thing people would talk about uh, because uh, as you see from many interviews this kind of political discourse is often perceived as something you know like politicians are imposing on us yeah but on the other hand if you like talk with people longer there's always some kind of family history uh, and some kind of uh, uh, family trauma related to the second world war to the redrawing of borders to forced resettlements for for example in Sambir. Uh, there are many um, Ukrainians uh, who were resettled from Poland or uh, had to leave Poland um, after Second World War. And so they, they still have like, they know that their grandmother is coming from a certain village in Poland. They would go and visit their village and try to find this house where she lived and try to find the ancestors on the local cemetery. And they they would talk to Poly, Poles living there, and so this is something discussed uh, in and comes up in many interviews. So the not not the so to say the memory was how they are um, um, presented um, and performed, so to say in, in in the political discourse, but uh, on the level of family um, histories and experience, I think it's the past is still there and it's it's painful. And I uh, had some people crying in front of me when, when they started to talk this story, to, to tell the stories, yeah. Thank you. And Larissa is asking, um, it's a bit speculative, of course, but uh, how different uh, would you, your findings be or would you expect your findings to be if you if it had been a really comparative uh, study living next to Poland or living next to Russia? Maybe it's more in, in terms of hypotheses. What, what would, I mean, this is all pre-war. Um, yeah. We're talking about. Mm. Yeah, it's... it's um... It's an, not easy to, to answer this question now because uh, our, we are so much under the impact of, of the current events. Uh, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I don't know. I. I think the the situation uh, would be more like ambivalent, but at the same time there would be probably more like polarization on the local level because some people would identify as clearly like uh, pro-Ukrainian, so like pro-Ukrainian activists uh, in in these local communities at, at the Ukrainian Russian border. And, and actually we know about it because um, uh, what happened in those um, places where I wanted to go uh, now in spring in Volchansk in, and in Kupiansk, which were one of the first to be occupied by the Russian army. So what we saw in, in the first days and weeks were uh, pro-Ukrainian protests, the people going to the streets and protesting like the, the, the Russian occupation and these protests were coordinated some local pro-Ukrainian activists uh, like veterans who fought in, 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 in the Donbass. And, and uh, so there is a kind of segment uh, of, of in, in these local communities which took like proactive pro-Ukrainian position. And, and of course, uh, uh, there have been people who were uh, somehow 
more like ambivalent or maybe even pro-Russian. So I would expect uh, probably more this kind of ambivalence and at the same time polarization in, in this, uh, at the Russian border. Yeah, thank you. Obviously, it's something that now can't be researched anymore in this, yeah. this way, and, and we'll, we will not know this unless somebody conducted this um, detailed local research beforehand, which at least I'm, I'm not aware of. Um, maybe I don't see any more questions in the chat. Maybe one, one last question, um, if, if I may. Um, sort of going hopefully back into the field and into a very different context now, but with some, still with some of the initial questions in your head. Um, sort of what are your expectations sort of in, in, in which way the war and in particular the, the dynamics of displacement will um, kind of affect the big um, issues you're looking at and that you put up also on your concluding um, slides, you know, be it dynamics around um, kind of past mm -hmm. and present, you could, you could see um, displacement and the experience at the local level, also people to people. Um, uh, contacts, mm -hmm. uh, contacts um, to to change the dynamics somehow. Are, are there particular expectations or hypotheses you you're formulating before you sort of go in there? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I I think the war is a huge melting pot. Uh, what is going on in Ukraine is that that it's it's a lot of movement. Yeah, so people from the east are moving to Western Ukraine and, and they are learning a very different um, um, like local cultures and, and ways of life. And so they are making this experience of uh, actually acquaintance on, on, a, on a mass level. Yeah? And, and uh, uh, it was already like that uh, um, before, like uh, I was surprised. Another thing I was surprised about is actually to discover how much, uh, how, how, uh, how many contacts and, and kind of networks actually exist connecting these places at the Polish border with Donbass on the official level, but also on personal level. So on the official level, um, they are like, uh, Fabrudet, what is this? The, the brother, brother cities, yeah, and the twin cities, yeah, yeah, twin cities. The, uh, the um, Slavyansk is the twin city of um, Sambir and Rubizhne uh, in Luhansk Oblast is the twin city of Chervonograd, and there was a program which actually supported cultural and and um, um, exchange, for example, and very funny stories about people were telling me about stereotypes they came with to, to Donbass and, and people from Donbass coming to, to them and being afraid of Banderitsi. And so it's, and I think there will be much more of this in, in, the, in the next time. Um, if these people, and, and they're already now, I uh, read reports about like uh, displaced people moving to these locations and starting some initiatives, helping the army. And, and so these are all the new networks like working together. But um, on the other hand, I don't know, these are two, two towns which do not offer much like in terms of jobs, yeah? And if people are going to stay there, um for like long term I, I i don't know if if uh, these places are attractive like for for people looking for jobs <clears throat> thank you tatiana thank you so much for your talk and for answering um, all our questions um thank you very much um, as always, we will put the recording up and uh, thereby widen and broaden our archive of social science talks on, on Ukraine on the Zoys website. And let me also already announce next week's talk, which will be given by Victoria Sereda from the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. And the talk will be on transnational experiences of displacement uh, from Ukraine. So we, in a way, pick up from where we left off um, yeah. uh, this week. Uh, so thank you very much, Tatiana. Thank you to everybody who listened in and see you hopefully again next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.